this is middle medieval middle eastern ceramics and this lecture is about the pottery of yemen so yemen is down here in the southwest corner of arabia and you can see it's rather distant from the rest of the countries we've been talking about um, but it is still part of the middle east and a part of the islamic world so it has connections but it's not in quite in the mainstream and has, has its own way of doing things sometimes so here is the campaign map and you can see there's a, quite a lot of sites in the yemen and this is because the rom had a major field project in the yemen uh, particularly in the 80s and 90s um, less so now of which i participated so in this uh, Google Earth image, you can see the Yemen has a lot of green, well, pretty green, greener than this. So this is not very green. So there's uh, the monsoon rains hit uh, Yemen quite hard. And the rains will then come down into the Red Sea. And uh, this coastal plain here, known as the Tahama Plain, is uh, has a lot of occupation relying on the um, retaining those uh, those floods during the monsoons. There are also important cities in the highland which are not on this map unfortunately. So here's a, a close-up of the field area um, centered on Zabid which was a regional capital um, of like the whole region at times one of the very important city and other important cities in the field project will include Hais, um, Faza, or Faza, which there are a number of uh, sites, and Galaifaka, Beit al Faki, which is just a town. Um, modern town. I don't know what's on this map. So, one of the aspects of this is that uh, you get a lot of longshore drift along the Red Sea coast and it creates these uh, little harbors but they keep moving along as the sandbanks move further along and so for instance at Faza we have a string of sites of different periods um, so it's quite interesting to have them discreet like that this is the results of the field survey and some of the, the later field survey we did while we were excavating um, most of this involves driving around in a truck and looking out the window, um, sometimes repeatedly going over the area and going down, up and down other roads in the, in the region. Uh, this is because uh, these bits here are actually filled with sand dunes and nothing is there. In fact, as once described to the director of the expedition, uh, Ed Keel, as being, here lies death. Um, so not a lot of uh, anything to find there. So, um, and you know, one time we go across, there's nothing there either. So it's, um, it's near the wadi beds that we have the occupation. And uh, this is where we found quite a lot of archaeological sites. This is, in fact, Ed Keel, the director of, of the expedition. This is the clay pit at Heiss, which I may have shown some of you before. Um, Hayes became a very important pottery production centre for the region and here are the nearby mountains. So as I said the Tahama is quite a fertile place um, with lots of agriculture and a worthwhile place to uh, to do things. Here is Galaifica. So this is by one of these little um, bays created by the longshore drift, a big sand bank off the coast here. And this gives you an example of, of what it looks like. Um, so I actually went to England on the way to Yemen for our first uh, season excavation in 1987. And I was told there, in no uncertain terms, there is no archaeology in the Yemen, which struck me as being absurd. Um, I have to say there weren't any archaeologists telling me that. These were Islamic art historians telling me there's no archaeology in Yemen. And I have to say it doesn't look like there's a lot of archaeology in places. Um, but fundamentally it's an absurd thing to say 
stuff which is under the ground isn't there until you like put a shovel into it. But in the Yemen, the archaeology was clearly evident on the surface. Uh, th there probably would have been at places like Galefica, which may not have been permanent occupations, um, there would have been um, mud brick houses, which could have completely blown away by the incessant sea winds. And so all that is left is the pottery. And then the surface will become what is known as deflated. The sand is blown away, leaving this, this uh, pavement. Uh, usually deflation in desert environments uh, is created by stones being left on the surface. But in this case, it's pottery. So you can imagine how it would be possible to just drive through the landscape and look on the horizon for slightly raised areas which were bright red. Well, you know, terracotta bright red, like this. Um, so finding the sites was actually quite easy. And this is Zabid on, um, on Google Earth. This is a, a relatively recent picture showing the current extent. A um, lot more development along this new road here. But the, the, the city itself was uh, said to be founded by the, a dynasty known as the Ziadids in the early 9th century, which brings us to the issue of dynasties. Uh, who doesn't love a good dynasty? So, of course, we had the right to guided caliphs. Yemen was uh, incorporated into the Islamic world very early during the life of Muhammad. Blessings be upon him. Um, then we have the Umayyad Caliphs, the Abbasid Caliphs, of which you all know all these guys. But then you have the Zaydi Imams, which I have mentioned. So these are a group of Shia, and they uh, are up in the mountains. Um, Sana'a is actually the modern capital of, of Yemen. And they have been either running these cities or running all of Yemen on and off since the late 9th century and we're actually running things in 1962. Then we have the Ziadids, as I said, 9th, 10th century mostly, um, ruling from Zabid, very important. They are followed by the Najahids, again from Zabid, the Mahdids, again from Zabid, and then the Ayyubids, who were in a number of places. Um, but you remember the Ayyubids, right? Came from Syria, started running the things for 50 years or so, and were then got fed up with the place and went back home to Syria, um, and were left and left uh, some of their their uh, troops behind, who founded the next dynasty, dynasty called the Rasulids, whose capital was in Taiz, another city in the mountains, uh, probably far away from Sana'a. Well, it is far away from Sana'a, you know. And they were followed by the Tahirids who were a native Yemeni Sunni dynasty. Um, so after that, you probably would have had some Zaidi things going on. And, but the Ottomans came down and were running the, wild, the place for about 100 years and went away and came back again, only finally being thrown out uh, during the Arab Revolt in 1918. So back to well, this is architecture. So this is Al Asher Mosque, uh, founded about 820. So the mosque and the city were founded as one. Um, this is Al Asher now, and this is a very interesting old satellite photograph, aerial photograph actually, of um, of Zabid from the 60s. I think about 1960, um, early 1960s. And here is Al Asher Mosque. And one of the interesting things about it is it shows that there were walls. You can still see the gatehouses. They kept the gatehouses because people live in them and things happen in them. So here's the, the gatehouse. But back when this photograph was taken, they had only recently stolen all the bricks from the walls to, to build with. And so the, the trench from where they stole the, the, the bricks is still visible on this. It's, it's all disappeared now, apart from the gates. And here is the citadel, uh, the, the um, administrative capital. In, in the top left-hand corner of it are the present uh, administrative buildings for Zabid and its region. Uh, but um, 
it's a, it was quite a large area that we actually made holes in eventually. Oh yeah, so this is where it was founded around this mosque. So here is a plan based on that aerial photograph and here you can see the defensive architecture and uh, you can see the mosques, there's quite a lot of them, this is a much bigger later one and the cemeteries around it and that sort of thing, it's very nice. And here is uh, the mosque right here and if you look at the street patterns it looks like it's almost completely random. Um, street patterns are typically not completely random there are reason for them to be the way they are but the thing is things change and so there's reason for for them to change so if you look if you use this as the core and try and look at different sorts of street pattern you start to get an idea or come up with a hypothesis about the development so here is Al-Ashir Mosque and in the streets around it there is a bit of an orthogonal pattern and at, beyond that orthogonal pattern there's a radial pattern now this sort of thing happens when you have a restriction and this is clearly shown here these are the tracks um, that came out of the gates in the the recent more recent walled city um, and so you're you're restricted here you don't go wandering all over the place you come through the gate and radiate outwards and that is probably what's going on here with this uh, core part of the city. Now this is really just a hypothesis. We haven't done anything to test it in any way. But um, interesting thing about it is it's about the same size as the Azakaba, which was founded in about the same time, also known as Ayla at the time. And it's uh, the exact opposite of, of this because the mosque is at the other end and this would be presumably because Mecca is in between if you remember um, mosques are oriented towards Mecca um, and this would suggest in fact the whole city is oriented towards Mecca and within this defensive area you can be anywhere in the city and pray in that direction and um, you're praying towards Mecca which would be very convenient uh, especially if the orthogonal pattern was a bit more orthogonal in those days and that's the same here and so most of the city is actually on the Mecca side of, of, of the Friday mosque so the, the street patterns would suggest that the city got bigger with um, later uh, restrictions around the settlement and getting bigger and bigger through time to end up with the, the current pattern. So it's just a hypothesis, but it does work with what otherwise looks like a completely random uh, street pattern. So the fact that it's a bit of a semicircle may be suggestive that at some stage it was a full circle because there's, there's no restrictions on this side to suggest that there is a reason for it to be uh, a semicircle. Um, this is this would be supported by our excavations uh, because we actually did excavations down here and over here and at that time they were in the city so it would suggest that this is um, probably not the full extent of the city at its height when it was the regional capital another excavation I'll mention is Zabid East which is just off of the map here. It's like Zabid but East. We also did excavations up here but didn't find very much. So amongst all these sites, as I was saying, there's Zabid, very important, sort of the central place of the region, and Hais, and Faza, Galefica. And in all these sites we found lots of pottery. Um, this was actually a photograph taken at one stage to show imports and it turned out later that these aren't, in, aren't imported. In fact this one isn't imported either but uh, all the rest of these are actually imports and that was an important part of the study back in the 80s was distinguishing between what was an import and what was locally made so it enabled us to start working out what they are. 
And also, I thought this would be a good place to put in the cat paw pot, because it's really only interesting because when this was set out to dry, a cat stepped on it. It was probably a bowl or something. And presumably it was then glazed. You're really not going to glaze a, a pot which is this wet. Um, you're going to wait till it's dry or possibly even fire it, although this doesn't. This looks like a once fired vessel, but if you like cats, you might like this pot. So, um, talking of is there archaeology in Zabid, uh, this is a uh, bulldozer cut through the, the bank that went around the city. And as you can see, once you like make a dint in the ground, there tends to be archaeology in most places. And to suggest there's no archaeology in all of Yemen uh, was actually kind of unsound. So I, yeah, so, and we excavated. Yes, here we go. Ah, I don't know. So don't forget the citadel. So here we have currently occupied buildings. This is the administrative capital, but on, over in this corner, it was largely desolate. The buildings were falling down and we actually restored some of them uh, because we wanted to live there. Um, I actually never got to live there because in the early season, we actually lived in a nice house. Um, but this is where they lived later on, and this is where the biggest hole was put, going very deeply into the city. Um, and we put a fence around it too. But it made it a nice, safe uh, enclosure. This is our first trench, which I opened um, in 1987, uh, uh, somewhat to the south and east of the, the walled city and would have had a nice big house on it, um, which lasted for quite a few years. The wall was actually going through here, and all the bricks have been robbed. It's just like the lower level of, of bricks on it. And uh, that's an important area because it's full of lavatories uh, lasting over several years, several phases, decades probably, um, here is a one drain, and here is a dry uh, cesspit, shall we say? And so that this is, um, and these aren't from the same period. So the, the lavatory was in exactly the same place in the house for some time, it seems. And this is a, a site slightly to the east of the citadel, where there's this bath in a more recent phase. And below here, there are there is industrial debris and occupation, so a lot going on. And at Zabid East, uh, we found a kiln, quite a nice kiln. I was suspected there was a kiln around here somewhere. We found wasters in the survey and found actually some very nice uh, imported pottery. But um, we excavated here really to, to look for the kilns. And here is... The excavators, one of which you know, this is me in 1987 or so. Not skinnier. Um, right, so lots of sites. I keep coming back to this thing, I don't know why. Oh yeah, so Haiz is here. I keep telling you this, so Haiz, Faza and Zabid. There's another site up here called Al Fashal, but we'll get to that. Um, so evidence for manufacture uh, was included trivets, um, kiln furniture found at highs, and um, there was a lot of it, so there's probably a lot of pottery going on. And if you look, see this is a red clay body, so this is a red clay body, but if you look carefully, and you probably can't see this in this manky old photograph, but the scars of the pottery that this was used to separate if you recall, glazed pottery needs something to keep it apart from other glazed pottery in the kiln, otherwise it just becomes a big molten mass. Um, this was used to separate white firing pottery. So not only do we have evidence of a red firing clay, we have evidence of a white firing clay. And this is a, a thin section through uh, one of those trivets showing the white clay scar and the red clay body, and the glaze keeping them together. 
So this is actually a kaolinitic clay uh, made of kaolin. Um, kaolin is cr the simplest type of clay uh, created by the breakdown of granitic rocks, particularly of the feldspars within the granitic rocks, uh, by a process known as kaolinitinization, um, which turn turns it from a feldspar into the clay, kaolin. And so the inclusions are dominated by what is left of the granite whence the feldspars have mostly rotted away uh, so it's kaolin and a lot of quartz and a few bits of feldspar which are very manky looking like this one <clears throat> this is this is amusing this is a lump of red clay in the white clay so normally when you see a nodule of clay you'd think oh this is from clay mixing but clearly there's none of this redness in all this white clay so probably this was just they were making red pottery and white pottery in the same place and a bit of the red got in mixed with the white. So the red fabric was uh, characterized by a lot of basalt. Uh, this is a fragment of basalt or feldspars and this sort of thing and also minerals derived from basalt like this clinoperoxene. This is a, a slip, it's like a stone crushed quartz slip shall we say and, and a glaze. And here's another piece of felds, um, felsic volcanic, uh, basaltic volcanic, I should say, and, and feldspars and things like this. So all of this is, is derived from basalt, uh, which is reasonable since this is basalt, this, this purple stuff is basalt. And the, 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 the wadi that goes past Heiss, where that, um, that big hole was, which is about here, uh, drains this, this area. So the white clay uh, would have come from a granitic rock, and that's what this is. So when we went out there in 87 and 88, I um, actually surveyed the geology as well to see if it was what it appears to be from the geological map we had at the time, which was uh, based on reflectance uh, from satellite photographs, so it's it wasn't particularly reliable, but indeed, I I did find that this is granitic, and it is um, turning to kaolin around here, so probably everywhere actually, but um, yeah, so to for them to make red pottery, they just dug a hole near the town, to make white pottery, they had to go and dig holes up here. Yeah, yeah, there. That's what I said. So for Shal, as I said, we found this site in one of the seasons I was there. Um, and what we found was this big heap of sherds which, and, and ash, which included a lot of wasters. So this one's actually a glazed one. There's a couple of glazed ones. Um, I ha and lots of, and this is a manky old picture. So there's a nice new picture of one of these sherds. Um, a waster so even if it's not attractive you can certainly see that it's distinctive and this has a granitic fabric um, but still discrete from the other uh, fabrics derived from the granitic rocks which is chiefly Zabid um, and here is Zabid here is Faza which I think I'm going to talk about next um, Faza was the port for Zabid so when Zabid was the capital Faza was the port, and so all that imported pottery would have been imported through this port. Um, and again, it's one of these places where offshore sandbars keeps a nice bay uh, to keep your ships in, um, which moves along the coast. So the earliest Faza is further south, and there's a later Fazas, and then modern Faza is further north. So Let's go back. So the pottery at one of these, no, as I was walking along the beach, I was looking at the, the sand, this nice, well-rounded beach sand. I was thinking, that would make a very good temper, I said to myself. I think things like that. It's, it's a consequence of, of the background, I think. And, and I was looking at the uh, overbank deposits on the other side of the sandbanks which form the coast, I thought, that's, that's actually quite good clay over there. 
I bet if you took the clay that's over there and added the sand that's on the beach, you could make nice pottery. So as I was walking along the beach, I got to the 9th century Faza. I know it's 9th century because it has this wavy line style, which I'll tell you a bit more about. See, there's wavy lines on, on most of it. And it's unglazed, which is what they were making in the area at the time. And this is just like the 9th century potter we were finding in Zabid. Um, but when I looked at it, and uh, I always have my hand lens in my pocket, uh, I could see that it was actually tempered with rounded sand grains, unlike the Faza pot, uh, unlike the, the Zabid pottery. And so when I brought it back and thin sectioned, I could in fact discover that, that it was filled with beach sand and uh, very complicated beach sand because the longshore drift mixed everything up from south of here. So it's nothing like any of the other fabrics and is filled with beach sand. That's kind of cool. So we come to Zabid and here's the kiln. So this pottery, again there's a lot of wasters from around here, uh, has an unusual inclusion which is this uh, granophoric um, micrographic feldspar with quartz in it and here's another one so this this is a, a very unusual texture and we only find it or I only found it in Zabid the Zabid uh, wasters and so it's quite distinctive um, not found like at Al Fashal or anything like that. So there must be something in the granitic rocks here, which come down to Zabid um, or, or up here, um, which has this granophoric texture in it to leave it in the wadi by Zabid and not at the wadi near Fashal, you see, which is pretty much similar type of rock but as I said this is this is a geological map derived from uh, a satellite imagery so it's not like someone went down there and banged the rocks together to see what they were so talking of the imports and the imports gave part of the structure to our initial chronology for the local pottery um, we have um, pottery from Basra uh, from the so-called Samara horizon and we have blue painted pottery and we have luster painted here you have the monochrome 10th century and here the polychrome uh, from the 9th century and this probably you're thinking wow what a manky piece of pottery but of course this has come from very far away and is one of the first luster wares to be thin sectioned uh, the only other early luster ware might have been another one this may in fact be the very first one and was the first to find out what the polychrome luster wares looked like. As it turned out, it was the same as the um, monochrome and the same as the blue and white, um, and not locally made at all. Also imported would be um, this. This is the, the slip and size wear from Iraq. This one's probably made in Baghdad. And also the turquoise glazed jars um, we found quite a, a lot of those. And this is uh, the, a nice picture of a wavy line where with the wavy line going on. Two wavy lines in this case. One of the distinguishing features of wavy line, true wavy line wear, and later what we call track wear, is that the wavy line is put on when the pot is wet. So you throw the pot, it's still a bit wet, and you put the wavy line on because you can see here how the soft clay has been rucked up by the incision. That doesn't happen with track wear. Track wear they seem to allow it to dry and when they scratch the line into it it, it gets all all fragile and and breaks off a bit so that's quite distinct. It does look different but at some time they decided to change that because there is some actual wavy line. Some of the early ones have some wavy line things going on. The track wear, uh, this is what Ed Keel called it. Uh, Ed Keel come up with some peculiar names for the ceramic types, some of which I changed in publications later. Um, track wear is 
just a bit more exciting than incised where because it looks like railway tracks because of all the parallel lines you see here's track wear which has not got parallel lines but you can see how it's been scratched into the surface rather than smooshed in when it's still wet so here's um, one of the earlier glazed uh, types this is what Keel called stars and stripes wear based on this particular shirt which has a star and a stripe on it uh, it has um, normally I like to give things technological names but this is uh, got an overall slip and underglaze um, chromium black and um, turquoise inglaze and uh, and an alkali glaze and is very complicated and so we stuck to stars and stripes um, as for the chronology of it um, the best evidence for the chronology of this wear is looking at these rims if you look at these rims they're kind of like what the Fatimids were doing to their luster wares in Egypt and if you look at the drawings this is actually the camel rim isn't it so it looks like they were copying uh, early Fatimid luster wares so between 975 and 1075 or so to make this pottery and that's that's the influence for it with these rim patterns and this rim shape so that would suggest a date a similar date for this pottery also found this is actually from Galefica the coastal site further north is this luster ware from Egypt and it actually doesn't look that distinct from the Iraqi luster wares but when it was thin section it was very obviously different and it's the first piece of Fatimid luster wear which was thin sectioned and so I could easily compare that to Fatimid luster wares from Fustat to find it's one of them and it was how this is identified as being Fatimid um, so this was an early attempt at thin sectioning the luster wares to find out um, where they're from how they can be distinguished from each other and it worked very well so another importive about that period is this from Iran which we call the hatched incised slip incised wear again that's my term um, this is found also at Siraf very important at Siraf I think I should do some from Siraf so it's a, a very important Indian Ocean a marker um, and here's another one quite nice very green a bit later we have imports from China there are early imports in, from China as well but um, this is a piece of uh, Celadon uh, made in Longquan in the Yuan period very very distinctive and here are some copies of it uh, so it, Celadon is very popular in the Middle East because uh, it was locally thought that it was um, you could not be poisoned if you ate out of a celadon bowl so not only did they import a lot of them but they also copied them quite widely and they did that locally so this is uh, made in about the Yuan era um, but made in Zabid uh, with this flat flattish rim like the Yuan's and the and the broad dish form and all that sort of thing and here's a so these are two different pieces of pottery pretending they're a whole vessel another type that seems to be made about this period with these very yuan um, celadon influenced forms is what keel called salad wear so salad wares um, have a lot of those forms and um, this is like the the dish form this is the bowl form that would indicate that they're derived in some way from Yuan Celadon um, but the painting is obviously derived from something else so why is it called salad wear well you have to understand that Ed Keel is English and if you've ever been to England you will know that English salads are not like salads in this country where you have nice fresh lettuce and 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 uh, mayonnaise or something on it whereas in England you have typically 
very green, very limp lettuce with this concoction known as salad cream, which has a very unlikely yellow color. Um, so this has a slip, it has inglaze green, it has uh, uh, tin in the um, glaze and is a bit complex to turn into a type name. So green and yellow seems kind of dull, so we kept calling it saladware. Partly so I can complain about salad cream, I think. And, and here's like another one of the forms. And this is the color, I keep showing you what it looks like. So another important group, which I renamed turquoise slip painted, because it is turquoise and slip painted. So it works very well for a technological term. Keel called this Blue Mountain Wear, because if you've ever been to Blue Mountain in uh, Ontario, a bit north of us, um, you will know that there's a pottery there, Blue Mountain Pottery. And in all the shops around there, there's a lot of it. It is what we call ubiquitous. And turquoise slip painted was ubiquitous, ubiquitous on all the sites that we looked at. Um, so it, he called it Blue Mountain, where I called it turquoise slip painted because I didn't want to go into print insulting the pottery of Ontario. And also it works. So turquoise slip painted, um, nice technology. Um, it seems to be the forms and the decoration seems to be influenced by pottery, which has been influenced previously by Chinese blue and white. Um, it always has a red clay body, uh, a white slip, could be stone paste or it could be clay, um, and an alkali glaze. The earliest example was probably this one. It has the same technology, um, it looks like this, but it has this rim that actually looks like uh, a relaxed camel. So there's this technology may go back to the 11th century or so, um, but most of them have become ubiquitous, shall we say, um, in the later periods. And we have motifs that, see this is rather, reminds one of the um, scroll motif on the back of Samarkand pottery that we know was uh, available in the Indian Ocean region and um, and other motifs as well, which look like they're derived ultimately from blue and white, but with like, other things in between. This is turquoise black painted, it's made about the same period. Uh, and then we have your actual blue and white, which is blue because it has cobalt on it, and it's white because it's either got a white body or has a white slip. Um, this one has a white body, this one has a white slip on a red body. Um, the dating of it is helped by things like this, so it's clearly copying blue and white, but this star motif, actually here's the waving rock pattern that I showed you on uh, Tamori pottery, um, the star pattern we find on this pottery, remember the Indian Ocean ware. So again, this is a, they're not necessarily copying imports from China, they're really copying imports from the rest of the Middle East, mostly Iran. I'm waving rock again. Yeah, I keep showing the same one. It, it's the same thing again. Haven't we always seen Am I going backwards? I think we're going backwards. No. Oh, I know what I'm showing you. No, I'm not. So this is a red-bodied one with a white slip. Here's the white slip without the glaze on. And this is a white bodied one. Did I say red body before? Red body, white slip, um, white body. So at first it was hypothesized this must be made in Zabid. This must be made in Heiss because we have evidence for a white body from Heiss. As it turns out they're all made in Heiss um, which is inconvenient um, but that's fine. And it's odd because we have no idea why, because it's not like the red-bodied ware is, is, has rubbish painting and the white-bodied ware has really nice painting. 
it's more or less the same. So it might be that they just had different workshops making more or less the same thing, um, but which had rights to different uh, clay resources. So who knows? Here's another white bodied one. Quite a nice one. So here's the, the red clay. And of course, they had white clay to make the slip and an alkali glaze. So, um, it's the geology map. I don't know why that's there. Right, so, Heiss cups are all cup shaped. Um, so, there's no scale on here. But if you can imagine, this would easily fit in your hand. This is, this is for, basically, this is for a cup of coffee, uh, a small cup of coffee, uh, about the size of, shall we say, a cup. And uh, they were very, very common all of a sudden um, in the 16th century. And the earlier ones are more nicely made, like this one and this one and this one and, and this one. And the later ones are not so nicely made. It's hard to become less nice and here's a slightly nice one as well um, so it seems that coffee uh, it might be relevant to mention that the town of Mocha or Mocha is actually on the Tahama coast a bit south from the sites I've shown you and um, so this is where coffee comes from and it became very very popular when the Turks were running things and it's possible that there is uh, an explosion of, of making coffee cups rather than just drinking coffee out of bowls. In this period, there was also a lot of pottery, oddly enough, from Iran. Uh, well, not a lot, it just seems like a lot. Uh, this is all um, from the city of Kerman. And there will be a lot more about this in the next lecture, about the pottery from uh, Safavid, Iran. But um, this was important at the same time. And it's funny that although the Turks took coffee home with them and it became uh, an international, international phenomenon to this day, um, they didn't send any of their pottery. They sent some of their pipes, but not their pottery. And so this, uh, gradually through time, it becomes less and less well, pretty, I suppose, is the term. This is the kind of pottery they're actually making there in recent times. I don't actually know. I, since I haven't actually been there in like 30 years, um, I don't know if they're still making pottery in um, Yemen, in the Tahama. But uh, this is the kind of pottery they were making there last. So this was found on the surface. So we don't know how old it is, but it could be relatively recent. So... That's the history of Yemeni pottery and the Roms research at, in the Yemen. That's uh, an interesting regional center with regionally distinct pottery influenced in many parts by the pottery made in the big centers that I've shown you about before. But it was uh, rather interesting nonetheless. Thank you.